This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 188, David Fairweather on Magical Change. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. This week's session is all about helping you to create that winning mindset. Hey, it's Jason Lynette here, and I want to kick things off actually with a quick five-star review. Thanks to somebody over on iTunes who goes by the name High Perf Living, as in High Performance Living. This is a five-star review that reads, These are not interviews, but conversations that we get the benefits from listening to experts having intellectual dialogue. And thank you so much for that review. And to everybody else, if you head over to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash iTunes. That'll redirect over, and that's actually where you can leave your review online as well, which helps us to increase that magical algorithm and getting more downloads and more outstanding guests such as the one this week. Joining me from Canada is David Fairweather, and David's somebody who I first met sitting next to at the uh, at the Anthony Gailey Corporate Hypnotist Masterclass, and getting to know David and some of his work and really interesting thinker on the process, and you're going to hear us get into the intellectual dialogue dialogue here of resources for clients that transition out of a career working as an engineer, now working in the helping professions, and then the whole backstory behind the publishing of his book, Winning Mindset, which is available on Amazon, and we'll link over to David's website as well as his book on Amazon over in the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com. Simple way of putting it, though, is winning-mindset.com. That'll give you the details on the book and some other helpful freebies and downloads as well. While you're on the web, also check out hypnoticbusinesssystems.com. This is the all-access pass to my hypnosis business training library. Everything from strategies to get out into your community and give talks and do business networking in such a way that actually works, as well as infiltrating the web and going global with your hypnosis business, plus some done-for-you marketing marketing campaigns. Check that out. Get access today starting at just $47 at hypnoticbusinesssystems.com. And again, check out David's website, winning-mindset.com for details on his book. And with that, let's jump directly into this outstanding intellectual dialogue. This is session number 188, David Fairweather on Magical Change. Okay. Well, I mean, like many people, uh, in my corporate job, uh, hypnosis wasn't really a thing for me. It didn't really enter my brain, didn't really enter my mind, wasn't in the lexicon, the language that we talked about. Um, but as many people do, I kind of discovered it through necessity. Um, I had a lot of issues with stress and burnout, and it kind of forced me to pay attention to my body and to kind of um, question at a deeper level what was happening inside me, very kind of psychological stuff. And I explored the uh, various hypnosis um, practitioners that were available to me and very quickly kind of found out, although this might sound egotistical, that I think I could do a better job than them. Mm -hmm. So I started to um, start to make myself self-hypnosis CDs and things that I would be able to listen to on a daily basis that would keep me really focused on the physical relaxation that I was prioritizing in my life, keep me really focused on healthy um, mindsets, frames of mind, um, help me keep my spirits up and help me really keep focused on the things that I was learning, which was really stress management, anxiety management, um, pain management, lots of really fascinating things. And that was really the origins of what I'm doing these days as I found that, um, as hypnotist John Chase kind of points out, repetition, repetition is a priceless um, technology that we can utilize when we don't get instant change. We can get change through sticking at it repeatedly, talking ourselves through things, cheering ourselves on. And so my dalliance with making self-hypnosis CDs uh, over a decade ago has really informed the process that I use to create um, – sound files that I get people to listen to. So if the change doesn't happen immediately in the room because of the magic of hypnosis, then it can at least happen through the magic of repetition and really simple mundane things. Um, it's really the, the origins of how I came uh, to, to get interested in hypnosis and to train myself and to be um, 
trained by lots and lots of really fantastic people um, around the world on this planet uh, and get me to the point where we're having this discussion today, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. What I love about that, well, first of all, what was when you say in the corporate world, what was that track originally? Well, I was an aerospace engineer, so I worked with high precision aerospace kind of tolerances. Um, I also, thanks to my teaching in aerospace, I was a computer-aided design expert and something that I taught to engineers. I managed to make and transition over to the world of automotive. So my corporate track was really having one foot in aerospace and one foot in automotive. And then between those two industries, whichever one was really um, in demand for employees or, or contractors, I would move into that industry and and kind of bounce between the two of them, but never really finding my home in either of those places. What I really enjoyed was the helping other people, the teaching mm-hmm or the training people. So I'm really doing the same thing now, just working with organic beings instead of uh, <laughs> and, and computer-aided models. And I'm working with people's virtual reality in their head. Yeah, I was going to ask is if there's something from that career that you think really served as that soft skill transitioning into working with people now. Well, it, it's funny. I never really thought of myself as an engineer. It was uh, something I kind of fell into. I was really interested in... Um, helping people and really interested in creative aspects of my life. And I found something where they would pay me to be creative in an engineering capacity, but um, didn't really think of myself as that. Um, so I, I don't think of myself as many smoker, non-smokers don't think of themselves as non-smokers. They are just people. Um, I'm not an ex-engineer. But um, I had learned through that engineering process a lot of um, attention to detail, a lot about following processes, repetition, um, reproducible results, um, being kind of creative in life. That engineering thing's really just given me some structure and some tools that help me um, be a bit more structured and be a bit more useful to people rather than, you know, your average flighty creative type of person i've um, i'm quite uh, bi hemispheric i'm quite um disciplined in both the discipline of creativity and in following protocols so i think it kind of rounded me out as a human being to give me a lot of discipline and structure Mm -hmm. yeah so then what i appreciated there in that introduction too was that talking about the magic of repetition that this category of the home audio is one that some in our community would often put down but here, here's a different model which is not necessarily going after that prestige uh one and done kind of result but instead here's this experience where something's there and just by running that new pattern something is writing over that did, did you find that as part of the model that helped you to get out of some of that uh issue that was there before well, yeah, lots of people do kind of race after that miracle one one shot fix, and that definitely happens. But it's something that um, analytical brains really struggle with. Well, well, how is that finished now? How is that over with now? How because we've done that, like this problem's gone. Um, the kind of leveraging the the um, the work of Anthony Gailey in corporate, like mm-hmm. where he really spoke to. Um, as you know, Anthony also, um, it really spoke to the repetitive part of that work. Um, I've really enjoyed John Chase's waking hypnosis CD. It's kind of fun and it really is just uh, waking suggestions. Now, when we take that stream and we think of it in those terms, there's a lot of hypnotists out there in the stage world arguing, we don't need induction. We don't need any of this ritual. We just need to suggest things to people. And yeah, that absolutely works when someone's in the right frame of mind and their suggestions are kind of coming across as something compelling, intriguing, something that they want to accept. That's fantastic. But we take this model to the nth degree. If we're not doing formal trance work and we're just suggesting things to people, then sometimes that's not going to work as immediately and as deeply as if someone was in a deep trance. Like Mike mm-hmm. Mendel's always saying, you know, why why do you like work when you can zone someone through the floor? Well, not <laughs> everyone is able to be zoned through the floor. And let's face it, not every hypnotist is able to zone every client through the floor. So when we don't have that um, miracle model and we're not zoning people through the floor, taking to the place where they cannot resist our suggestions, then we're just telling them things 
in the way that any marketing campaign tells people things or the way that any teacher tells you things over and over again or if a parent tells you that you're a good kid or that you'll never amount to anything over and over again, this informs our model of reality. And so I'm simply utilizing and, and leveraging that natural function that uh, takes away that, that need for the immediate one cure prestige, which means no risk of failure. Mm -hmm. No risk of failure. That, that even the most logical person being told something that's a little out of their comfort zone, a little off in a slightly different way of thinking, that you know, over and over again, that re uh, repetitious suggestion kind of sinks in, this, the way that we work. So I think of it as a, a, a valid way of working with people and not something that we should be shying away from. But, but understanding we'll, we'll, we'll pick up all the people that don't get hit in the miracle cure on the edges, on the fringe of this with repetition. So well, I mean, to look at it's another tool in the tool bag that here's everything that we know is effective. And, you know, we can talk about intensity, but also we can talk about as as it's come up here, repetition, that um, it's not the one trip to the gym. It's not the one day of eating right. It's that consistency over time and beginning to rewrite that software. So now here's something that's going to work better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The consistency over time thing. Uh, and, and I'm happy to use that. Um, just because it gives people comfort, it gives people things that they can repeatedly engage with. They're not wondering, you know, did that work? They're wondering, when will it work? Mm -hmm. Right? And so uh, I had this great analogy that was given to me in a, in a photography class in college uh, I don't know, about 10 years ago or so, when they were kind of explaining this antiquated uh, model of, of f-stops and shutter speeds and, and things of this nature, aperture, uh, which were a little confusing to me as a novice photographer, but they kind of gave me this metaphor of a Coca-Cola can, or it could be a Pepsi-Cola can if that's your preference. Um, I'll, I'll do ginger ale. But the opening in the top of the can is, um, is, is correlated with how quickly the fluid would empty the can. And so if you want the fluid to empty the can quickly, make the hole really big. And when you turn the can upside down, it just falls out. But if the hole is any smaller than the, than the entire kind of um, surface area of the top of the can, then it's going to take some time to leave. And some, pe some hypnotists, I think, give um, kind of weak, small hole suggestions to people where it doesn't necessarily empty the can. But through repetition... It would do because it would just take more time with these miracle one cures are someone that's essentially got a suggestion so powerful that the entire top of the can is taken off when they turn it upset upside down flop the problem falls out there is an intensity of suggestion and the less intense the suggestion the more frequently and repetitiously that suggestion needs to be administered the more intense the suggestion is the fewer times it needs to be administered so we also have really a way of making up for the perceived intensity of a suggestion because it's not our um intended suggestion that lands it's always the perception of that um suggestion so we're playing with um how it's heard by someone and there's so then do you have any specific advice let's say for the hypnotist that's out there in terms of how to phrase the suggestion how to build something in such a way that Yes, it may land exactly as delivered, but it's also their own personal interpretation that's going to create that shift. Right. Well, it would come down to motivation. Um, I remember uh, Anton Jackwin telling me um, out on the town in London um, a number of years ago um, that you couldn't walk up to your average policeman and hypnotize them um, to take you for a ride in their police car. But you could hypnotize them to believe that you're the chief inspector. And then it would be entirely appropriate for them to take you for a ride in their car. And so I really learned in that moment, um, motivation is key. And when you're finding the reason why a change is happening, and the more people can kind of connect to the reason why the change is happening, the emotional drive for that change, then the more likely that that suggestion is going to land. So in answer to your question, I'd say um, increasing the intensity of the suggestion through motivation um, it helps suggestions, and if you you can't increase the intensity, then just 
repetition gaslight people until they believe you can hypnotize them <laughs> so then i mean back to the the personal side of it making the audios for yourself is there some discovery is there some mechanism that came out of doing that that's really influenced the way that you now build those let's say for your communities for your clients well um i think it comes down to a believable performance we're really selling chemical states here or whether that's kind of electrical impulses probably both of those things are true but we're selling a state and you know, if you're in the state of thinking something's funny and you're laughing and you're telling someone how serious it is, that's an incongruent state. So they're not going to receive your communication about how serious something is if you're not expressing in your voice the seriousness of this. And then you take that to the nth degree of they're not going to believe um, or you're not going to believe your own suggestion of something being reality if it doesn't sound as if you believe it's reality. So again, the intensity of the suggestion comes down to um, how believable, how, how much the suggester is believing their suggestion indicates to the suggestee how much to believe the suggestion from the suggester. Mm -hmm. You know, if you believe you can, you can kind of a thing. So being congruent and putting your suggestions in a place of believing that they're true so that you are subcommunicating the actuality of the outcome of that suggestion, I think would be really important. I mean, telling someone that they're going to go into a trance um, when you snap your fingers, while you obviously don't believe that that's going to happen when you snap your fingers, they're probably going to wonder what they're supposed to do at that point, since you don't fully believe they're supposed to go into a trance. <laughs> so, you know, it is the it is the simple things, but it's being completely congruent in your suggestions and transferring that communicating that sub communicating that belief to the listener so this is a theme that's that's popped up in conversations here before where i mean here's i, I would go back to the uh, reference of the french magician jean eugene robert houdin uh, of course because who would say that the magician is really the actor playing the role of a magician that the magician himself has to believe that he's actually plucking coins magically from the air rather than thinking, oh, I'm hiding it behind this finger at this angle to the audience, and I perform this quick maneuver, which makes it suddenly snap into position, and that's how the trick works. If they're thinking that way, then they're stuck in that mechanical mindset, which I mean, to fast forward, there's also people like Igor Letohovsky who talk about the H plus state, uh, or just to simplify it all, as in from improvisational acting, you go first that, you know, to be able to look at the client and associate with them as their result and bring them along for the ride. Is there something that you can unpack that you're doing to help to facilitate that, that congruency, that consistency? Hmm. Unpacking congruency and consistency. Um, well, in the box of this congruency and consistency, if we take it out, we, we're looking at the same thing we were looking at from the outside. And then you're not really sure if you've got the inside of the box or was it the outside of the box again? Like when it's congruent, mm -hmm. it's congruent. And so um, uh, difficult to unpack f for me in this moment, kind of taken by surprise, a belief. Yeah. <laughs> And, and really, uh, you know, beliefs, I'm going to say beliefs just are, but, you know, we know they're not, they, they aren't just a belief. They've been um, nurtured into being. They've, they've existed because they've been brought into existence, and we hold on to these beliefs as if um, they're true, but they're a perspective. All, all beliefs are just what we believe currently with the data that we've currently got. Um, I think... When you talk about acting and, and method acting, I think maybe there's where um, the magic lies. A, a good method actor is going to believe that they are the character that they're playing. So even if they've got a backstory that impacts their performance without them ever actually voicing the backstory, it gives them um, a place to come from where their story makes sense. And I think the backstory of all hypnotists is essentially that we, we have access to this um, – uh, age-old wisdom of how the mind works and how people can be kind of brought into a place into a mood of influence and if 
if our if we understand that our backstory is we can do all the things that we've seen people do, everything that we've been trained to do in a classroom, even things that we've done that have failed with certain subjects, we can we can do those things with the right people. And if we hold on to that backstory, that we have this wonderful ability to share uh, the workings, the inner workings of the magical power of the unconscious mind, then we've got something really incredible to share with people. And they'll find it to be incredible when they, when they connect with what's happening. Um, but if we ha have a very kind of scripted place where we don't quite believe it ourselves, then the story that we're trying to, to communicate to other people is not quite so compelling, not quite so believable. So I think it's, it's incumbent on all of us to, to retain this backstory. And every time we go to a training, every time we see something magical, to log that in our mind, put that in a kind of hypnosis bank, because this is a thing I'm going to think about when I need to remember we can do magic. Hmm. And as long as, as we remember that we can do magic, then magic can happen. That's a beautiful way of phrasing that, of uh, bringing it together with, you know, this perspective that here's what the work can do. And um, how would you respond? I, I keep hearing this quote, and I uh, I always come back to the uh, line from the comedian Bill Maher that I don't know if this is a fact, but it sure sounds like it is, uh, <laughs> that uh, I would keep hearing people use the phrase in hypnosis that the process, process isn't magic, yet the results can be magical. Right. Which I can think of examples like, well, no, we created magic in the process in terms of how the mind is perceiving something, how the mind is adjusting towards a different reaction to something. Well, it just comes down to what the word magic means. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of fun. I mean, there's so much um, oldy weldy wisdom twisted into our words. I mean, I have fun pointing out the word cult is written right in the beginning of the word culture, so up front and in your face, you don't even <laughs> <laughs> it just goes past your conscious realization. Um, you know, words, we spell, and, and some words we use can be quite magic. So magic spells literally exist. Beautiful. And, and when we curse people, you know, curse words, swear words, th this is wishing ill will upon people. And, and these words exist too. And we are all magicians wielding powerful words of good and evil <laughs> and <laughs> spreading them across the universe as we go. Like words are powerful and magic really does exist unless you think magic means a thing that doesn't exist. And then, of course, it doesn't exist. Magic. <laughs> Outstanding. So then taking that and let's say informing how you now work with your clients, what, what's that focus of someone coming into your space? How does that uh, experience typically play out with them? Um, well, they come with a lot of kind of preconceived notions about how things are going to work and what's going to happen. And, you know, my job is to bring them into a world where this isn't witchcraft and warlockery that's a new word i've just made up <laughs> this is this is you know common sense sound psychological um a, a sound psychological protocol that we're following um and when you can kind of uh, set it up that it's just the way the brain works it's just the way your neurology works it's just the way you encode things and you can kind of really simplify it well that is another way, really, of inspiring this feeling of awe inside a child. When you tell a child about Santa Claus and their mind goes, oh, wow, that's incredible. And it opens up to the reality of Santa Claus for however long that becomes real. I find the inverse works, that you can take some people that are quite skeptical about magic and bring them into the amazingness of how real this is and how mundane and normal it is. And that gets their mind to be, oh, my God, this, wow, this is crazy. It's interesting. Your neurons do that. Like, you know, the science of it is our uh, everyday magic that we use now. So I like to use the magic of science, the magic of common sense to work with people these days. Mm-hmm. So how does it, can you give an example of that? An example of magic and common sense working. Um, you mean things like the, the meta pattern, uh, bringing people into the way that their um, brain encodes information, you know, mm -hmm. um, the uh, idea that what wires together, uh, uh, fires together, wires together, and, and how through some repetition we can get different patterns to start wiring together. 
Um, so when you inform people about, you know, like as you're whining about your problem or going on about the way you don't want it to be, you're actually deeper ingraining that into your neurology. Is that what you want? Obviously, people back out from that. And you can gain a bit more control in the session by having as less of a therapy session, having people talk at nauseam about their problem, but to start recognizing the danger of going down that road again. Um, so that can really kind of bring people to the point where you are questioning them for useful bits of information. You're not open ears and open eyes waiting for the end of their really long three-part traumatic sequel. <laughs> to come to a grinding conclusion you're getting right in there to do the work yes yeah, so it'd be in there interactively addressing it is there is there a story that comes to mind of working with somebody where that change was clearly in motion from pretty early on the change to get out of the problem being in motion from early on yeah hmm uh, a story of someone that almost fixed themselves before coming in to see me or pretty early in the process of being in the space with you Early. Well, things tend to kind of happen quite rapidly in the space with me, unless I'm doing work that kind of crosses multiple issues and time with people. Um, but um, I think I've had some really wonderful successes with insomnia, where people have been really holding on to their uh, insomnia story. And quite quickly in that process, um, getting them to kind of establish uh, what their a preconceived reason for maintaining the insomnia is and as you kind of talk to someone in that kind of language immediately they start questioning the point of the problem and it does start to break down so then of course by the time you've found a few of the the triggering incidents um and any trauma memories that are playing back to kind of uh clean those out uh and and pull them over to a different way of thinking the work just comes together like this um, collapsing house of cards where their frail problem is that they're protecting it from the breeze and protecting it from the wind, but they're not protecting it from a completely different way of looking at it, which surprises them and starts to blow some of those foundational cards down. Um, mm -hmm. Specific story. I'm not, not nothing's coming to my mind right now of someone that really started to change early on in the process um, but i'm certainly going to open my eyes and start paying attention to that more now you kind of made <laughs> a good story for another interview someday there you go we'll set you up for howard cooper so <laughs> inside joke so taking the experience then of uh being in process with somebody what are some of those go-to strategies that often uh make up that experience with the client um well i'm always looking so I kind of think back to those those uh, sound file creation days, these mm -hmm. things I, I create for people. I'm always looking for the motivation, and I want to understand how this maps across all senses. So um, I think the most important thing that I that I do is figuring out, you know, what's success going to look like, and what's it going to smell like, and what's it going to taste like, and what will you be saying to yourself when you're successful and what is all of that going to feel like so something that i think is really important a fundamental strategy would be again in shot blasting in making sure that if you're not putting all of your um uh, hopes on, on a miracle cure and you're going to spread this across the board then of course connecting with all five senses mm -hmm. is going to be important thing that you do and I kind of jokingly say to people if if uh, if you weren't experiencing the universe through your five senses you would have no evidence that you were alive because you wouldn't be thinking hearing words like none you wouldn't know you're alive now you wouldn't but by having your senses or experiencing them you know you're alive but you can't prove you're awake you could be having mm -hmm. this interview with me right now, Jason, and then, you know, in a few minutes be like, oh, my God, I, I, I'm, I'm still in bed. I forgot that interview that I've been thinking about, daydreaming dreaming about all morning. Um, that the senses are the way that we process the world. So I definitely want to map across as many senses as possible as I'm bringing people into their new reality. So it's uh, kind of finding, leveraging where they'll use the new skills so that you have somewhere to place the change, understanding where, how that change will have happened across all five senses so that you can start mapping out that new future and placing into it things that you can notice with all of your senses um, to, to see that that change has happened.
So I'm, I'm not sure if I answered that question. No, that's yet, beautiful. But, what, I, what I really appreciate that is that, you know, we get that client who sometimes comes in and says, oh, I'll just know when I feel better. Or I'll just know when this is no longer an issue. And to get into the sensory representations, here are those specifics we can start to aim for that, you know, we can work in this sort of top down perspective um, where we can, you know, aim towards that you'll just feel it, you'll just know it. But to get into those specifics, we now have that dartboard to actually throw the darts at. Yeah, exactly. And if, uh, you know, if we, if we probe our clients correctly, if we ask them enough really, you know, deep conversations, we're going to find out things that they didn't realize were important to them. And so when you get that kind of surprise of, well, oh, this is actually the feeling I'm going to have. I thought it would be this, but it's actually going to be that. Um, it, it, it starts to create that change for them from the inside because the, this off in the distance, menu they couldn't quite taste is now right in front of them and there are some surprising options there it starts to become really real for them as they're they're kind of testing out and uh tasting all the things that are going to be happening when this change has occurred um, really starts to bring the reality of that future into now so that there's not a great deal of work that they have to do um but go just a little further and to make it actually happen yeah, absolutely. So then what uh, what was that inspiration then to put a lot of this work, a lot of this thinking into a book? Um, well, I've been working on um, some corporate talks for a, a little while and getting out there to speak to people and make changes in companies. And it's a very um, organizing process to put your thoughts into a linear format, you know, page one, page two, page three, all the way to, to the end. And I thought it would be kind of useful for me to, to get some strategies out and some, some um, exercises and kind of put them out in a, a way where I could introduce this story to someone and bring them into the reality of change from simple facts onwards. And that would help really organize my thoughts, but it would then make it really easy for someone else to read through page one onwards and get to see a process kind of explained um, so they can understand it in a completely different way. So it was kind of um, as an introduction of my services to companies, but also uh, that kind of side benefit of organizing my own processes, aspects of the workshops and seminars that I give, but laid out in a way where it, it can make sense. So I did it primarily I think to see the sense myself, but then to share that sense with other people. Um, and you know, when someone else can read what makes sense to them and it just makes sense, I think you've done a, a valuable thing. So uh, one of the psychologists that's reviewed my book recently, um, 88 years old with lots of really uh, phenomenal friends and influential colleagues, uh, thinks it's, a, it's something that is fundamental to high school seniors and college freshmen that, that they need to read this, which wasn't my market. I was trying to explain this magic in a basic way so that people could really understand the reality of this magic uh, and have accidentally put it in such a potentially dumbed down format <laughs> that it's, it's, it's perfect for children to read and set themselves up with. Not my market, but I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, anyone that learns something from it is, uh, is a bonus to me. Well, I mean, to look at especially the fact that here are specific strategies, here are specific methods that someone can pick up and start to use for themselves. Um, sorry, was that a question in there? Just no, I was just saying that's a helpful way of doing it. Is there is there one of the strategies that tends to stand out to kind of talk through the listeners here in terms of way to think about something differently? One of my strategies in some way to think through it differently. Um not really sure i'm not really sure how people are thinking of it already to be able to think of it differently mm -hmm. um, i mean you've asked a fun question and the reality of it is i've made none of this up jason and so i've put into words obvious um obvious things that work these aren't strategies that are you know they only work with a certain professional using them these are just obvious things like if you about to walk on stage and you tell yourself oh god this is going to be terrible no one's going to like this talk that's not going to be as resourceful a sentence to tell yourself as i'm going to do my best this is going to go as well as it can go 
you know, which is not Pollyanna-ish, but it's somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm really just taking, as I said, old world wisdom, things that have been used for, for countless years, generations, thousands of years. I'm just putting my words to them. And so um, the thing that is different about this book is I'm explaining things with a sense of humor. I'm explaining things with a good uh, tongue in cheek. I'm explaining things where I'm prodding people. And so it isn't really the mindset of them using these techniques or, or how to think of them differently. The techniques are really bog standard, simple techniques. What this book does that I'm proud of is that it makes it real and normal and understandable for someone that, that isn't thinking metaphysically, isn't thinking spiritually, isn't thinking, um, you know, off the deep end. The, these are simple, basic ways that people can impose change upon themselves. And we know they work because they work for advertising companies, marketers that spend millions and billions of dollars on this stuff. We know they work because teachers use these techniques, parents use these techniques. I'm not creating um, a, a special cultish mindset that people follow. I'm just saying it like it is and explaining that positive self-talk is going to help you when you need it much better than negative self-talk. As obvious that, as that statement is, to me, the magic is how that's presented in the book as it comes out in jokes and in stories. Um, the mindset being you can change your mind. And as long as someone is in a mindset where, OK, they're open to the fact that that's possible, then uh, the, the barrage, the arsenal of techniques that's thrown at them in, the, in this book is just going to give them things to, to cherry pick from themselves and figure out for themselves which one of these hundred techniques appeals to them. Outstanding. So then where can people check this out online? Well, it's um, on Amazon, uh, amazon.ca, amazon.com. Uh, it, it's there available. I'm uh, currently working on an audio version of this. It's going to be available on the website winning-mindset.com um, or I think winningmindset.co is also uh, another vanity URL I took out just in case people don't like the dash in winningmindset.com. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, available on Amazon and um, people are downloading it on Kindle and the, the paperback version I'm particularly happy with. Uh, all of the illustrations have been created by me, not drawn by me. I did use puppets. Um, to do all of my work as I puppeteered everything like a maniacal genius uh, to come to fruition. Um, but yeah, basically Amazon and anywhere else that you can get Kindle books, um, it's available for download. Well, outstanding. Some real workable knowledge and some interesting mindsets in terms of uh, how we work with our clients and how we help to build that system, that uh, ecology for success. Uh, Dave, it's been awesome having you on here. Thank you so much, Jason. It's been a pleasure being your uh, guest. Um, my virginity on your podcast has been well and truly shattered. Um, so that's fantastic. Phenomenal. Thank you. Jason Lynette here once again. And as always, thank you so much for interacting with this program, for heading on to iTunes and leaving your reviews on there as well. That helps us to get more downloads and outstanding guests in the future. And also check out hypnoticbusinesssystems.com, the all access pass to my hypnosis business training library. It's Netflix for your hypnosis business. All the details online at hypnoticbusinesssystems.com. Join the community and I'll see you on the inside. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. Hey there, it's Jason, and I want you to be one of the first to find out as we upload amazing new content. So do this right now. Click the subscribe button right here on this video. That's going to link you to our YouTube channel here, and you will be the first to find out as new resources and downloads are made available. Do it now.